heavenly host. Men and women may see Christ in vision or in an appearance as a solitary personage, but no person has ever seen God the Father without also seeing a host of others. They are referred to in scriptures as a heavenly host or numerous angels or concourses of angels. There is a reason that a company is always shown at the appearance of the Father. You should look into the matter. Within the answer lies a great truth about God the Father. Throughout Scripture, the Father is described as the God of hosts. Seeing Him includes an accompanying host or concourses of angels or train or a similar reference to others with Him. He appears with the heavenly host because God has a family, including a spouse. See also the glossary entries, names of God in Scripture. Jehovah Sabaoth Heed and Diligence we consider that God has created man with a mind capable of instruction and a faculty which may be enlarged in proportion to the heed and diligence given to the light communicated from heaven to the intellect. One of the great and succinct declarations about coming to know God is found in Alma 9, paragraph 3. Men and women come to God by giving heed and diligence to what God asks of them. I cannot do that for you, nor can you do it for me. It is the sojourn of every individual. The mysteries of God are his hidden but simple truths. They set a man's bones on fire. To pay heed to God requires that we not harden our hearts. When we have hard hearts we know less. Even what we once knew can be lost. Hell the prophet Joseph Smith described the true nature of hell, a man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, they shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone. It is a misnomer to speak of the kingdom of the devil because the description presumes something more organized than is the case. It is difficult to organize when fear, hatred, and anger are the primary motivations. Love is a far more cohesive, creative, and loyalty-producing motivation. All that Satan does is designed to destroy itself, as well as all those who follow him. An endless hell is an invention of the historic Christian faith. How can the gates of hell be opened? It requires someone upon whom death and hell could have no claim to go there. When justice itself requires him to be released, then death and hell are conquered. This is what he would do. He would suffer the wrath of the guilty and vile, fully assume their punishment and abuse, and bear their penalty of death itself. When the fury relented and the wrath ended, he could reclaim life. His captivity ended the captivity for all. Having then returned to life, because it was just for him to do so, he acquired the keys of death and hell. Now he can open those gates for any and all because it was unjust for him to have been put through either. He can now advocate for others by virtue of what he suffered and the injustice of that suffering. Death and hell are the devil's domain. He's the god of that world, and since we have death and suffering here, he calls himself the god of this world. Those who come here are subject to his buffeting and his will. They are tormented, tempted, troubled, and then they die. While captive here, they endure the insults of the flesh and the difficulties of trying to find their way back to God. The references to the hell that hath no end is that same play on words that is defined in TNC 4, paragraphs 1 to 4. It is a place of torment, where people suffer as in the celestial kingdom or the world in which you presently reside, to paraphrase the LDS endowment. How long will people endure such an experience? Until they repent, see TNC 69, paragraph 26. What if they do not repent? They will suffer, worlds without end, see TNC 69, paragraph 28. Holiness Purity of Heart See also the glossary entry, Sanctification 
Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is most correctly understood as the individual spirit within each man or woman. It is the heavenly record from each one's prior experiences, although now veiled. In that sense it is a he. Or, if one is female, a she. The Holy Ghost is the light of truth. In that sense, it is in it. The Holy Ghost is also the received communication, inspiration, or light from above, and the source of that light can be any number of holy beings sent to shed that light upon mankind. In that sense, it is a they. But mankind wants it to be singular, because that makes it easier to grasp. The Holy Ghost is a personage. It is an individual. It is a spirit that will dwell inside man. The Holy Ghost, which resides inside of each person, receives intelligence from Christ. The Holy Ghost is the record of heaven that man has lost contact with because of the veil. It is a personage of spirit who resides inside each man or woman, and one must receive it after baptism by finally listening to that inner truth of all things or record of the Father and the Son, Genesis 4, paragraphs 9 to 10. The Holy Ghost bears record of the Father and the Son, see Genesis 3, paragraph 4. When the Son speaks to individuals through the Holy Ghost, they hear the words in the first person, hence, the Holy Ghost speaking that it is the Son in Genesis 3, paragraph 4. Your spirit or your ghost is within you, connected to heaven to such a degree through this process that you are in possession of a Holy Spirit or a Holy Ghost within you. From Adam until Christ, the Holy Ghost was the primary voice by which revelation was delivered from God to mankind. It is active and has been active in delivering the words of prophecy to holy men throughout history. The scriptures have explained that the Holy Ghost which dwells in man, this personage of spirit, has the following other descriptions or attributes, the record of heaven, the comforter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the truth of all things, that which quickens all things, which makes alive all things, that which knows all things, and has all power according to wisdom, mercy, truth, justice, and judgment, Genesis 4, paragraph 9. This is a description of the personage of spirit that dwells inside each person. This is the Holy Ghost. This is something that can be in contact with the Holy Spirit or the mind of the Father and Son. There are many times when the term ghost and the term spirit are used interchangeably. The distinction is not appreciated by some translators. Therefore, if there is a difference between these two, one will need to be careful about trusting different translators' use of the terms. They may not have any distinction in mind. No man can receive the Holy Ghost without receiving revelations. The Holy Ghost is a revelator. God is no respecter of persons and makes the Holy Ghost available and accessible to all. See Acts 6, paragraphs 3 to 6 and Epistle of Jacob 1. Paragraphs 2 and 5 The Holy Ghost, which is the mind of the Father and the Son, can be communicated by pure intelligence, light poured into the mind of a man, a ministering angel sent with a message, a ministering spirit sent with a message, an open vision, a voice from heaven, or any other means designed to convey into the mind of the man receiving it the truth of things from God. This first comforter, or Holy Ghost, has no other effect than pure intelligence. By doing as the Father and Son have asked, you receive the Holy Ghost. Did you notice the Father and Son promised the Holy Ghost, and when you receive it, the Holy Ghost bears witness of the Father and Son? Ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son, and ye have received the Holy Ghost which witness of the Father and the Son unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, 2 Nephi 13, paragraph 3. The first promises to you the last, and the last bears witness of the first. In one eternal round, the doctrine of Christ includes all members of the Godhead combined into a witness that will come to you, take up residence within you, and make you a vessel of the promises fulfilled. You are to return home and take your abode again. 
or, more correctly, permit them to take up their abode with you, John 9, paragraph 8. You become the record of God's dealings with mankind. You become the promise of God's presence, for you fulfill the promise which he hath made. You receive the record of heaven, or, more correctly, the record of heaven, for it is a proper name and title, Genesis 4, paragraph 9. When it has come to you, then this record of heaven will abide with you. You will know the truth of all things, for it will reside within you, Genesis 4, paragraph 9. You will understand wisdom, for she will be with you. You will know mercy, possess truth, and be capable of performing judgment, for the judgment you judge will not be yours, but will be given to you, 3 Nephi 13, paragraph 1. God will dwell within you. When he appears to you, you will see him as he is, for you will be at last like him, 1 John 1, paragraph 13. If you can understand this, then you will purify yourself to receive it, 1 John 1, paragraph 13. For the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost will purge and purify, refining you with that holy fire, Malachi 1, paragraph 6. The purpose of the Holy Ghost is to allow you to see things in their true light with the underlying intent behind them and to allow you to do that without distortion and without confusion. The Holy Ghost bears record. And record, recordare, means to put back into the heart. It means to intensify in the heart, to have knowledge and remembrance of what you had before. This has to do with your previous existence. See, your heart is your core. To record is to stir up again in the heart. And Christ says this is why the Father will bear record of Christ, and the Holy Ghost will bear record, 3 Nephi 5, paragraph 9. That will recall things to you. That's what a record is. The Holy Ghost allows one to resonate with the same frequency as the writer and to hear what he is writing about. The process is far more abstract than logic, reason, rhetoric, and historic precedent will uncover. Capturing the thought of the inspired fisherman requires an inspired reader. The Holy Ghost is a guide to speak to man as he studies the scriptures. It will lead each person to understanding, harmony, clarity, and truth. If one has not experienced this kind of awareness while studying the scriptures, then it needs to be attempted. See also the glossary entry, Gift of the Holy Ghost. Holy Order The Holy Order is the channel through which all knowledge, doctrine, the plan of salvation, and every important matter is revealed from heaven. Among other things, the purpose of the Holy Order is to put in place a mechanism by which God can reveal from heaven what is necessary for the salvation of man on earth. In every generation, when God has provided salvation for mankind, it is the holy order that is used by God to fix what is broken, restore what has been lost, repair, heal, forgive, and reconnect those who are willing to give heed to the message sent from heaven to enable mankind to become sons of God. It conveys blessings and information that are withheld from the world. The holy order commenced before the world with Adam. He obtained the holy order in the beginning and before the world. Included with it is the right to preside over all of the human family and the right to minister to Adam's posterity. Adam continues to hold that presiding position and will do so until the end of time. The holy order was much greater in scope than later priesthoods. Later priesthood functions should not be used to define the original. Something as narrow and limited as a man or angel laying hands on another man did not and could not convey the original holy order. After the time of Eden, conveying the original holy order required either a temple or an ascent into heaven. The other fathers were holders of the order, but it is the role of the oldest living holder of it to ordain others into the line. Many think that the renaming of the Holy Order to the Melchizedek Priesthood, in order to avoid the too frequent repetition of the name of the Son of God, was done out of respect for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and that is true enough. 
but the holy order after the order of the Son of God includes the first man, Adam, who is also identified as a Son of God. There are other sons of God. The holy order after the order of the Son of God makes those who inherit it, by definition, the sons of God. Therefore, in a way, calling it the holy order after the order of the Son of God is a way of identifying the recipient as someone who has become one of God's sons. The holy order, in its truest sense, is much more comprehensive and far-reaching than just laying on hands to convey permission to perform ordinances. When the return of the original holy order is contemplated, it will involve restoring great knowledge that is hidden from the world. The fathers knew it would be restored in the last days. Joseph Smith also prophesied of its return and explained the forefathers of mankind anxiously anticipated its return. Priesthood, in its most meaningful sense, involves the holy order after the order of the Son of God. The restoration at the end of creation must return to the beginning. Before the return of Christ, everything, including the original holy order with all its components, must be restored. That has not yet been revealed to the world. It will return before the Lord comes again in glory. It will be necessary before the return of the Lord for the original holy order to exist in all of its ramifications. It must be established on the earth and include all of the rights that originally belonged to Adam. It must be accounted for and returned back to Adam and then to Christ. It will include men and women as husband and wife. They will be given understanding of things which the world cannot know. Initiation into the holy order provides greater knowledge and fortifies the soul for one's ministry. It includes the right of dominion over all creation, the same right originally given to Adam that belonged to God. The right of dominion over this creation is why God is God. In essence, the holy order is to create a flesh and blood a living, mortal surrogate for the father and mother. It is the nature of this holy order that it is conferred upon the man and woman jointly. See 1 Corinthians 1, paragraph 44. The holy order is familial. It does not involve establishing a church, but, instead, connecting together the family of God, or in other words, the government of God. This can only be done in a temple prepared for that purpose. Because there is still a great conspiracy to destroy the souls of men and to capture this creation, the holy order is guarded by carefully qualifying those who receive it and is under God's control and supervised by Adam and Eve. Holy Spirit The power of God which fills the immensity of space, see TNC 86, paragraph 1. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is called the light of Christ rather than the Holy Spirit, see TNC 86, paragraph 1. The relationship between the Holy Spirit or light of Christ and every living thing, whether a planet, plant, animal, human, or ecosystem is direct, immediate, and continual. They are all borrowing power from the Holy Spirit to live, move, breathe, remain organized, and do according to their own wills. See Mosiah 1, paragraphs 9 to 10. Holy Spirit of Promise The Sealing Word of God It must confirm or ratify a sealing for it to become eternal, as described in TNC 157, paragraphs 35 to 39. All mankind's ordinances contemplate a further ratification from heaven. If one does not obtain this promise sealed by God, through his word, sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, then there is no promise as pertaining to the ordinance. The only thing that will endure is that which is established by God, or, more completely, through his word, which is then sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. The sealing of things through the Holy Spirit of promise must come in mortality. This hope is to be gained in mortality as a gift of faith to empower the recipient to be able to claim it in the next life. Mortality is the time and place for obtaining faith and hope. When out of this life, the season for faith has passed, 
and the opportunity for hope has ended. It cannot be developed there. The only exception is set out in TNC 122, paragraph 5, Thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, All who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. Also, all that shall die henceforth without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom. The Holy Spirit of promise can extend to even single people who receive the word of the Lord by revelation here in mortality that they will be sealed and live in the eternal marriage covenant, even if they do not obtain that sealing while still mortal. Any promise from God confers this hope. What he commits to someone here, he is bound to deliver there. The term Holy Spirit of Promise is used without adequate appreciation that it can be an office held by divine appointment. Joseph Smith became the Holy Spirit of Promise through operation of the divine appointment to hold the right. The office is held by more than just a single mortal man at one time and includes others who minister on earth as well. These, at a minimum, include the Lord, John the Beloved, the three Nephite disciples, Elijah, other angelic ministers, as well as potentially others about whom nothing is known, see TNC 35, paragraph 3. This Holy Spirit of promise is given its name because when one has received the Father and the Son, he becomes their child of promise, the inheritor of all the Father has, a member of his family. To reject this, as Joseph described it, is to deny the sun at noonday. For to have been given the Holy Spirit of promise, one has seen God and received from him a promise.